so um, I, I, would, I would like to thank you all for being here. It's, it's a great pleasure for me. It's a great honor. I'd like to thank um, Alex Tai. I'd like to thank uh, uh, everyone who's in the, in the Vietnam group that you just saw here. Uh, Keith Taylor, Orga Droll, and the greater Cornell community, and others who I understand who are here from inside the Cornell community and outside the Cornell community. Uh, thank you, thank you for, for being here uh, tonight and for inviting me to speak at this uh, event. On the forthcoming book, which isn't out, it's going to be out in June uh, or early July. Uh, first in the United Kingdom with uh, Penguin, and then it'll be out in the States. Uh, uh, it's called Vietnam, A New History, with basic books in New York uh, in, in August. Um, how do you start? I thought about it. I think there's just a few things I have to say, maybe to give you the context, the flavor about why, why I would write a general history, especially when Keith Taylor wrote an excellent general history before me, but I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it at the time, I, and that's true. Um, contrary, the first thing, contrary to what you might think, I never set out to write a general history of Vietnam. To be honest, I've never really had a major issue about Vietnam or a message, I gotta be honest with you, for or against the wars for Vietnam, be it the American or the French one, that I wanted to convey in, in a general history. I might have a few differences of interpretation with friends, some of whom are here, some of whom who are not, but I've never really had a major ax to grind, to be honest with anyone in the field. It's true, I do take Francis Fitzgerald's book, Fire in the Lake, to task a little bit in the introduction uh, of, my, of my book for essentializing uh, the Vietnamese past in order to fit it to her anti-war present uh, at the time. But I've gotta be honest with you, I know Francis, I like her, and I published her essay on Paul Moose, uh, to whom she dedicated Fire in the Lake, uh, a great French Orientalist, and so I published her chapter, which is a fine chapter, in a book that I edited uh, on Paul Moose. And although I went to college in the 1980s here in the US, as the third Indochina war carried on, in other words, I was born in 65, Vietnam War for me, I wasn't quite involved in all of that, but there was the third Indochina war uh, that that I was aware of, but I have to be honest, I never grew up in a family that was very, I grew up in Kansas, it was, I'm not saying that you, in Kansas, you're not, you know, I'm not saying that today, uh, that you're not politically motivated or anything like that, but I came from a family that wasn't touched by the Vietnam War, my father wasn't in the Vietnam War, um, and it, it was kind of an apolitical family, if I can put it that way. So I didn't really have a reason, you know, kind of a message that I wanted to get through in, the, in a general history. I did, however, have the chance to study and to do research in Hanoi in the late 1980s. And then I was able, as Fivan said, to pursue my PhD in France on the Asian context of the first Indochina War between 1945 and 1954. Uh, and I did that with uh, people like Pierre Bouchou and Nguyen Taeang. He directed my PhD uh, at, the, at the Sorbonne. Um, if I had to sum it up, I do have a training in Southeast Asian history, French colonialism, and international relations for the 19th and 20th centuries. So it's, a, it's kind of a hybrid. <laughs> it's kind of a, a melange uh, that kind of started with my undergraduate years at Georgetown. I was in the School of Foreign Service. And then I had a big interest in uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, and Thailand. Uh, which took me to Thailand, took me to Vietnam. And I don't know why, I really don't know why. I, I wanted to work on the first Indochina War. That's the only thing I can really tell you, you know, and that's where you get you know, weird things like a dictionary to which I'll return in a moment. Um, so you know, th th that's kind of where I'm coming from on, on that score there. Again, you know, no goal of writing a history of Vietnam. I never had the goal of writing a history of Vietnam from the origins until the present, until actually Penguin press contacted me out of the blue in 2008 when I was hard at work on my historical dictionary, my historical dictionary of the Indochina War. And I'd like to just say maybe a word about this dictionary because I think it's key for me to understanding or to explaining why I accepted of all things to write a general history. Now, as strange as this might seem, I had always wanted to write a dictionary. <laughs> part, of, <laughs> part of it was just madness, I have to be honest with you. Uh, most sane people, 
Well, the sane people can write dictionaries. I have no problem with that. But most sane people, in my opinion, they edit a dictionary and they farm out the entries to some 40 or 50 you know, other people uh, to help out. Now, I did have wonderful help on collecting information from a, a lot of people, but I decided that I wanted to write all the entries myself. So there's about 2,000 in this dictionary that you have here, or 1,500, I'm, I'm, yeah. And I wanted them to do it myself. Um, I liked the idea of doing history, producing history in different ways. And I thought it would be interesting to do it via a dictionary. I admittedly had a secret plot to come up with entries as well that would force people to think, or those who would read it, <laughs> uh, that would force people to think of the Indochina war in maybe multidisciplinary ways, transnational ways, and as Fivan rightly said, in sociocultural ways as well. Uh, I've got nothing against battle histories, they're in there. I've got nothing against generals, uh, they're in there as well. But I had this kind of idea that I wanted to use the dictionary to force people to think about other type of things that go into a war. So I introduced a lot of different states besides just the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, which is very important and it's in there. I introduced a lot of people, Ho Chi Minh's in there, Bao Dai's in there, but I think I introduced a lot of other people whom we don't meet often in uh, the, the history of the Indochina War. I also tried to introduce a lot of ideas that were born of the war, but which had been written out of history. So to be really honest, I enjoyed writing hundreds of entries on things like children in war, religion in war, social mobilization, cemeteries, music, cinema, desertion, migration, myths, gender, photography, uh, and so on. So my point is this, I'm not trying to sell my dictionary, my point is that when Penguin contacted me, when they contacted me in 2008, they did so at a time when I was admittedly finishing up the dictionary. I was between projects. I had another project that I wanted to start about which I spoke uh, earlier today. Uh, but it just landed on my screen, this idea that, would you like to do a general history of Vietnam? And this happened at a time when I was seduced by the idea of going in the opposite direction of going in the opposite direction of the dictionary. That is from producing micro entries, uh, you know, for specialist and attempting synthesis history, not for the war buff or for the Indochina wars specialist, but also this time for the general reader, the, uninitiate, the uninitiated. Now the rules of the game were spelled out to me very clearly by my editor. A general history for the informed general reader those who travel and who want to know more about Vietnam than they get in the Lonely Planet take on this country. You should still be able to attract specialists of Vietnam, but don't go overboard on the details and the footnotes. 500 pages, no more, of clearly written, jargon-free, engaging prose if possible with juicy <laughs> quotes. <laughs> these, were the, these were the rules I got. With juicy quotes, he didn't quite put it that way, but that's what he meant. Um, with really good quotes and anecdotes, anecdotes to start off each chapter uh, if possible. Other than that, other than that, my editor left everything wide open, so I considered myself quite lucky to some extent. There was no rules really on periodization. It was supposed to be modern Vietnam. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and he left it open how I could organize it thematically. So there wasn't a rule. It had to be, you know, chronology from A, you know, to, to Z from start to finish. I repeat, I didn't have a political axe to grind or a big person or a big idea to try to take down. That said, I did feel strongly that there was much missing in the existing histories of Vietnam, which tend did, to focus on two sides, the American one and perhaps the French one, uh, and the Vietnamese one, meaning the, the one led by Ho Chi Minh and his uh, entourage. Now, there's nothing really, anything particularly wrong about this. People can write the books they want. Um, they can write the books they want, 
But I felt that there was so much more that could be said about this fascinating country of Vietnam that existed already in the general histories that are, that are available. I'm not going to name them. They're good histories, but I thought that you know, perhaps a little bit more could be done. Several other things came together in my own intellectual development around this same time that got me thinking in very different ways about Vietnam, about history, I would say, in general, and to go on, and about how to go about organizing, writing, and thinking through a book like this. For example, from my dictionary experience came the simple but successful idea of, well, let's put stuff in there that people haven't thought about and see where it takes us. After all, why write a general history if it doesn't take account of the mass of new information that's come, you know, scholarly studies, articles that has really poured off the, the, the presses in the last 20 years in particular. So I would say since the end of the Cold War and that generation, many of them are here. Uh, why not take advantage of this instead of just writing that which has already been written again, which would have been the easiest. Obviously, I, I tried to read as widely as possible to put a lot of this new stuff, if I can put it that way, into the book. And that took a lot of time. That took a lot of time. Uh, but it was well worth it, I think. Equally important was the influence of years of teaching, not just about Vietnam and Southeast Asia, but also about French imperial world and diplomatic history. I, I, I really can't underestimate the impact of my teaching experience on the course of this book or the shape that it, that it ended up taking. As you may know, uh, Thievon mentioned it, I am a professor of international history. I do have my training in that. I was recruited for my specialty uh, in international history on a north-south, you know, third world, the developed world, that sort of stuff. But anyways, I, that's how I got my post at the University of Quebec at Montreal. Um, but it allowed me to work not just on international history, but it allowed me as well to work on decolonization, of course, on my own specialty on the First Indochina War. But I've also been very fortunate over the years to be able to teach and learn an amazing amount in masters and PhD seminars on imperial history, on world history, on decolonizations, on we have a series on great historiographical debates between historians at our university, which turned out to be one of the most stimulating seminars I've ever done, how historians write history and, you know, they don't get along all the time. And so that was that was a really, uh, really, really important type of seminar as well, and as well as questions of periodization. How do you periodize what you're going to write about? So it was this confluence, this kind of <laughs> coming together of all these different things, but based on this kind of weird conjunction where I'd finished the dictionary and I was like, that was fun, although it almost killed me. I was like, that was fun, doing history kind of by entries. I said, that would be interesting to take up that challenge of doing a synthesis history and going in exactly the other direction. So I put everything on hold. I had a project that, you know, again, that I, I'm, I'm hoping to get back to soon. And I delved into the, the general history of Vietnam uh, that I'm presenting to you, uh, obviously, tonight. I might also add one thing about my training in France. Um, it was such... Uh, I don't want to overemphasize it, but I did do um, my MA and then my PhD uh, in France, and I was immersed in a kind of a French school which binds geography and history together quite, quite tightly. Um, kind of coming out of that Brodelian school of thought, but also with people who work on Indonesia. I was very influenced by someone like uh, Denis Lombard, uh, who wrote the, a big, big book on, on Indonesia in three huge volumes, but uh, about connections, uh, synergies, uh, synchronicity, sorry, uh, and this sort of thing. So again, all of these things tended to come together, and I think I would be dishonest with you tonight if I were to say that I was not keen, interested, or it's just, you know, I can't help myself on weaving these themes into a readable general history of Vietnam. So rather tonight than reading my introduction to you, or instead of trying to argue against someone in the field, 
I thought I would introduce a few of the themes that run through my book and which um, we could certainly uh, question and debate because they're choices. They were my choices. They could have been other choices as well and that would have changed the whole course of the book. Um, and I, th I, I think we agree on that. But it's up to me now to present uh, some of the themes that run through uh, my book. Let me start with the first one. It's the problem of theology. Let me just say a few words about this problem. And I don't think there's really too much debate, at least here at Cornell, about it. Until recently, nonetheless, Vietnam has commonly been understood to mean the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, first declared independent by Ho Chi Minh in 1945, <coughs> excuse me, as the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Now, the conventional narrative that you have in most of the general histories moves rapidly from the French attack on the Vietnamese monarchy in 1858 to the emergence of Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam in 1945 by way of discussion of French conquest, um, <coughs> excuse me, colonial development, colonial modernity, and the rise of Vietnamese anti-colonialism, nationalism, and communism. Ho Chi Minh stands out as the main character in this narrative of modern Vietnam. He allows historians to follow him and to follow his Vietnam, of course, from Saigon in 1911 when he left, to Paris where he is in 1919 when uh, the Versailles Treaty is going on, and then on to Moscow in 1923, 1924, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, and then on to uh, Hong Kong as he embraces communism as the best road to attaining Vietnam's national independence in 1945. This popular account then culminates in the French and American military defeats in Indochina as the Democratic Republic of Vietnam marches to final victory over its enemy, South Vietnam, if you like, or the Republic of Vietnam in 1975. It's a story, it's legitimate, but it's one story, it's more or less the story of Ho's Vietnam. Now, Frances Fitzgerald, her highly influential book, Fire in the Lake, which you may have read, went furthest, I think, in establishing what has become the standard account of modern Vietnam in the English language. Even before the communist victory in 1975, she had proclaimed Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam as the real one. Not only were the Americans supporting the wrong leaders, meaning Bao Dai, uh, the French-backed leader of the state of Vietnam, then Ngo Dinh Diem, they were also placing themselves according to Fitzgerald, on the wrong side of history. That means Vietnamese history, as defined by Fitzgerald as being a timeless, deep-seated culture of resistance to foreign invasion and colonial domination, reaching back to the Chinese, uh, which Ho and his Vietnam incarnated. Like other righteous rulers before him, in Fitzgerald's hands, Ho Chi Minh becomes the rightful new sovereign who had emerged in a time of great disorder to seize the mandate of heaven with the support of the people. Published, as you know, at the height of the anti-war movement, Fire in the Lake sought above all to show how the Americans and their empire, just like the French and theirs before them, were doomed to failure. Now, whether you're in agreement or whether, you're, whether one is, is for or against American intervention in Vietnam, whether or not you're in agreement with Francis Fitzgerald, I submit to you this evening that there are nonetheless problems in terms of how this American-focused account of the war represents the Vietnamese past. One, by assuming that Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam of 1945 incarnated a timeless, traditional Vietnam with its roots deep in Antiquity, an antiquity which was destined uh, to win in the present, this, this Vietnam that Ho Chi Minh would incarnate, I think Fitzgerald gives us a very essentialized, unchanging Vietnam, much like Paul Mousse did as well in France for the first Indochina War. This problem, of course, is that of teleology, because it frames, it frames the Vietnamese past uh, from antiquity and sends it on a linear route straight to Ho Chi Minh and straight to victory in 1975. The problem is, is that it prevents us from seeing, in my opinion, the multiplicities. 
It prevents us from seeing the complexity of Vietnamese historical experience and the different possibilities for the future that were present at the time. That's why in my book, communist nationalists led by Ho Chi Minh are certainly important, just like they are in my dictionary. But communist Vietnam was but one of several possibilities. And I submit to you that no history of this country is complete without taking into account competitor states, competitor entities, competitor leaders, such as, brace yourselves, French Vietnam between 1858 and 1945, under men like Albert Sarrault, Pierre Pasquier, and Léon Pignon. Um, my point is, is that that French Vietnam, I'm against colonialism, I have no problem with that, but I do think we have to have a history which includes and takes seriously uh, what I call French Vietnam between 1858 and 1955. We need to include the associated state of Vietnam led by Bao Dai between 1949 and 1954. We need to, and I'm not the first to say it, uh, include the Republic of Vietnam forged by men like Ngo Dinh Diem Nguyen Van Thiel and others between 1955 and 1975. And we need, I think, too, to include Highland Vietnam, marshaled and led by men like Leopold Sabatier, Leo Van Long, Hatai, E.T. Iban, and many, many others. Now, these alternative polities undeniably failed, sometimes miserably so, but their stories spanning more than a century deserve our attention if we are to understand today's Vietnam. After all, and I, 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 you will all, you'll let me know what you think, Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam had to engage <coughs> with each of these entities in order to prevail, starting with Sahos in the 1910s. There was not one historical Vietnam after 1975 that to write about, no more than there was ever one United States, despite what the victorious Union historian said after 1865, and I grew up in Kansas, which is neutral between the two, so I'm not making the, uh, I'm just saying that there was a history that was wrote about those who were defeated during the American Civil War as well. You have to factor in uh, everybody into this story. And as one astute observer put it in relation to the American Civil War, I quote, to exclude all thoughts of the alternative is to lose contact with how it felt to peer into the inscrutable future, close the quotes. In short, it's not a question of being for or against the North or the South, whether it's in the US or Vietnam. It's a question, in my opinion, to dare to follow that piece of advice, to peer into the unscrutable future without knowing necessarily where it's gonna end up. It's no longer necessary, in my opinion, to write the history of Vietnam as the unique story of the victors, of the winners. We might also try to think of modernity in similar terms. And this is my second theme that runs through my book in one way or another. Much ink has been spilled over the rather slippery notion of the modern, of modernity, to say nothing of postmodernity. For many, I think modern simply means something recent, not old. The 19th and 20th centuries usually fit the bill best for delineating modern Vietnam as something recent, something modern. For others, of course, modern refers specifically to a Western historical transformation which culminated in Europe and in North America, the Atlantic world, in the 19th century with the advent of such things as industrialization, uh, bureaucratic rationalization, urbanization, secularization, capitalism, and the rise of the nation state. I think we can quibble over a precise de definition, but I think you would agree that these are the, the main ingredients that go into the modern. Now, according to this school of thought, Western colonial expansion in the 19th and 20th centuries exported 
these components to the non-Western world in one form or another. Now it can be done independently as in the case of Japan, Thailand, or say Turkey, or it could arrive directly through the colonial connection, the Western colonial connection, even the Japanese one, as in Vietnam, Burma, and Algeria. Until recently, I'm sure the older folks among us here, when we studied Chinese history, you, you'll, you'll recognize this. Until recently, most histories of modern China began in 1842 with the Chinese defeat at the hands of the British during the First Opium War. Only then the story goes, or did go, did China embark on the road to modernization, progress, capitalist-minded industrialization, and socioeconomic organization. The history of modern Egypt starts the same way with Napoleon Bonaparte's invasion in 1798 and the opening of the country to the West. The theme is the opening. The opening, that's the, that's the periodization. But there's problems, as one specialist of China has pointed out. We tend to use the term unmodern to refer, I quote him, to, that, to what existed in Europe before 1800, 1800 and what existed in the rest of the world until Europeans arrived and changed the way people did things, or alternatively, I'm still quoting him, until European ideas and opportunities were made available to people in other parts of the world to adopt and to adapt to fit their local situations. I quote, quote a number of scholars writing on Vietnam and colonial Indochina subscribe to this Western-centric conception of modernity and its accompanying periodization. And I include myself among them until recently. Like the 1842 date for those writing on China or the 1798 date for those writing on Egypt, most specialist writing of modern Vietnam begin with the point of Vietnam's colonial contact with the French in 1858. Now, that French colonialism was a major modernizing force in Vietnamese history. Few would disagree, I certainly do not. However, the periodization, the defining and the framing of all that is modern in Vietnam in such terms comes, I think, with problems. For one, this periodization creates a great divide. I borrow this term from Pomerantz, Kenneth Pomerantz. It creates a great divide in Vietnamese history between a pre-colonial or a pre-French past on the one hand and a much more detailed 19th to 20th century Vietnam on the other hand, the time during which the country became modern. Secondly, I submit to you tonight, by assuming that modern Vietnam began with the French attack of 1858, we lose sight of the complex set of pre-existing historical phenomena. We lose sight of a plurality of lost or multiple modernities, I'm borrowing a little bit from Alexander Woodside, that went into the making of a wide range of different Vietnams, including the one that was there in 1858. The meritocratic Confucian examination system and the rational though contested bureaucracies it nurtured were components of political modernity according to Woodside in China, Korea, and Vietnam long before 1858. As Emmanuel Poisson has shown, far from replacing the pre-existing bureaucracy and its civil servants, French administrators often grafted their colonial state in Annam and in Tonkin, in the central part of Vietnam and in the northern part of Vietnam, they grafted it onto this pre-existing administrative state that they took over. They grafted, therefore, their colonial state onto it as an effective mechanism of rule, an effective, an effective mechanism of social control, an efficient method of political administration and a source of information, and that might be the most important point, the source, a source of information without which the French colonial moment would not have lasted for long. French efforts to develop Vietnam's roads, canals, dikes, 
are very important. They are, and I show it in my book. Their attempts to, and their successful attempts to develop uh, the rice trade, for example, were very important. But if you look closely, and if you look at some of this new scholarship that I told you about at the beginning, we're now learning that they're picking up on earlier type of modernities that were already there. So again, I'm not saying that European modernization didn't count. There's a lot of it in my book. You won't be disappointed, and it did matter. Uh, my point is rather to suggest that modernity is not necessarily an all or nothing phenomenon. It exists in multiple forms. It exists at different points in time and space, and it often blends with and builds upon pre-existing ones. It can disappear as fast as it arrives. It can even coexist with the unmodern. If you don't mind me just pointing out, neither French or Vietnamese women had the vote between 1940, before 1945. And if you look at the work that Peter Zinnemann's done, Wynne Marshall has done, Emmanuel Poisson, Gérard Sage, Olivier Tessier on these dikes, on the administration of the Nguyen Dynasty and before, I think they made points they've been able to show that there was a level of modernity that was quite interesting for the bureaucracy, notions of charitable giving, uh, industrial winemaking. I just read Gerard's uh, PhD thesis. Olivier Tessier has done uh, some fascinating work on dikes. Uh, and of course, I think Peter Zinnemann pointed out, at least for me, it was the most fascinating thing of, of his history on the prison, was that Foucault doesn't quite work in the colonial, non-Western context. In other words, the French remained as unmodern as Zalom, if you like, before. Uh, we can come back to this, but I'm just trying to make a point. I'm just trying to suggest that modernity is not a straight line either, and it's not quite what we think it is sometimes, and it could be interesting to look at it in a different way. That said, that said, I am not, and I repeat this, it's very important, I am not out to construct an Asian-centered approach to modernity in the place of the Western-centered one. That's not my, my goal. Uh, all I'm saying is it's useful to keep these wider spatial and wider temporal considerations in mind. Why? Well, once again, I think they allow us to see the Vietnamese past and other paths as well in new ways. And this is why, and this is going to be debatable, this is why I intentionally left open the precise timing of modernity's birth in Vietnam in my book, rather than insisting that modern Vietnam only emerged from 1858 onwards. This makes room for multiple modernities it makes room for colonial graphs. It makes room for wider connections that the Franco-centric 1858 approach misses. It is an admittedly more complicated story, but I think, and you'll tell me, such an open-ended periodization makes it a much more interesting one than perhaps we've thought. And if we can believe such scholars like Sun Lai Chen, Jeff Wei, Li Tana, John Whitmore, Keith as well. One of the reasons why the brief Chinese colonization of Vietnam in the early 15th century was so important was because it provided the Vietnamese with access to some of the most modern gunpowder weapons of the time, a sophisticated bureaucratic model, even if everything didn't work out in a straight line, and a colonial ideology which the Vietnamese needed for their own rethinking and rebuilding or building of a new Vietnam long before the French arrived on the scene. Starting in 1858 is problematic for another reason, a third one, a third theme that I try to develop throughout my book. First, by starting the modern history of Vietnam in that year, one would not know that today's Vietnam is the product of its own colonial history. One would not know that today's Vietnam is the product of its own colonial history, not just the French one. But one need only look a little before 1858 to see that the French were not the first colonizers, for example, in the Mekong Delta. 
or the Red River Basin. The latter zone was the cradle of Vietnamese civilization right here, reaching back for a long time in the past. But it was part of the Chinese empire for a millennium. That's a thousand years. So there was no S Vietnam. It's a colonial construction. It's a colonial construction, but for a thousand years, more or less from the first century BC to the 10th century BC, there's some periods, etc. cetera. Uh, Vietnam was a province, the southernmost province of China. What's interesting about this, and this might be my geography from France coming in or the world history part of me, uh, but you can see how the French Empire early on, the French Empire, the Chinese Empire, excuse me, was drawn towards Inner Asia across the Silk Road by trade. Trade with the Roman Empire, but trade also with the Parthian Empire. Trade, there's a lot going on in the, in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean. Uh, the Roman Empire was certainly important, but there was other big empires as well. And they were trading, as you well know, with China. This is what explains you know, the extent to which the Chinese Empire moved uh, towards inner Central Asia. The point I want to make is that we now know from a lot of the new research that's been done is that the trade with the Indian Ocean all the way to the Middle East and Rome by, uh, by, by, by maritime routes was also pulling the Chinese towards Southeast Asia and towards Vietnam in particular. They needed it for access to the trade uh, with, the rest, uh, with the rest of the region. I'll come back to some of the neighbors a little bit later on. Once independent of China, in the 15th century, there was a moment there from the 10th century to the 15th, they came back. Once they kicked the Chinese out again, this time the Vietnamese began building and pushing their own empire southwards using many of the models that they had inherited from the Chinese and the gunpowder as well. That helped when you do colonial expansion. So they began building and pushing their own empire southwards, establishing protectorates over far-flung regions, promoting settlement colonies, alternating between direct and indirect methods of rule over distant, multi-ethnic peoples, testing cultural assimilation, and developing their own mission civilisatrice as they went along. Uh, it wasn't a French one, it was one which was heavily borrowed from the Chinese, and we can come back to that if you like later on. The Vietnamese were far from finished when the French arrived. And rather than stopping Vietnamese expansion in its tracks, the French often reinforced the Vietnamese imperial project in many places by making them their privileged partners in building another colonial state, the French colonial state of Indochina. Dai Viet becomes independent, but you have the Cham uh, people who are here, a constellation of states uh, running down the coast. Uh, with links to the Indian Ocean, with the links to Indonesia, and further to the south you have the Khmer Empire. Uh, you have the Nguyen, in a, in a way it's not the, the Dai Viet state, it's the rebel Nguyen lords who will continue the process of colonial expansion towards the south. I am simplifying in a massive way, I have no choice. Uh, but there's a colonial push and it is an empire I submit to you. You can't understand Vietnam if you don't accept that they were colonizing as well. We come back over definitions and terms in a minute. Just to give you an idea, this Vietnam that you see here is not an S. It didn't last for very long. This is Ming Meng's uh, Vietnam in the 1830s, uh, and he pushed it to the west. So uh, we got down to here, you just saw on the last maps, but then you have a colonial push towards the west into Cambodia uh, and into parts of Laos. It will be uh, reduced later on, it'll come back to the S form, which we, we know today. So the French pick up on it, but you can see that this already looks a lot like French Indochina. It might not be an accident. And within the French colonial state, there was a second pre-existing Asian one, that of the Vietnamese themselves. And I submit that these intersecting imperial projects, as complicated as they are, are very important to understanding modern Vietnam. Now, some will object to this focus on pre-French Asian empires in the making of modern Vietnam. My problem is, is that I think such critics forget that colonial connections and empire states were not unique in the West, and they were not unique to the 19th century. 
They are part of a wider global history made up of empires running from one end of Eurasia to the other since antiquity. You've seen the Roman Empire, you had the Chinese Empire. So we have new scholarship on this as well. I mean, I'll be honest, it has inspired me. I'm thinking of Frederick Cooper and Jane Burbank's recent work on empires and world histories. I'm also thinking of Peter Perdue's work on Qing colonial expansion into Central Asia, Tibet for example, in the 18th century. And he insists that this is, in, this is important to understanding China today. Charles Holcomb, Erica Brindley, Kathleen Baldanza's work on early imperial China and its deep south from the Qing to the Tang is required reading, in my opinion. It's influenced me greatly. Some of the most sophisticated, I think, and groundbreaking work on non-European empires has been done on Russia. I'm thinking of Daniel Evans, Mark Van Hagen's work. It certainly comes to mind. But my point is that by ignoring the role of pre-existing Asian colonialisms, we fail to pick up on the complexity of countries such as China and Vietnam. We fail to pick up on the novelty of the form which we all assume to be timeless. The S in the Vietnam, right? It's, it's pretty recent and it's a colonial construction, just like all sorts of countries across the globe. This wider view of imperial projects helps to guard against projecting, in my opinion, these kind of homogenizing notions of ethnicity and national identity back into and back onto a much more complex and diverse and in the end, fascinating past. It also provides a glimpse into state formation as a work in continual progress and I think it sheds light on how power operated in Vietnam across time and space before, after, and I submit to you right through 1858, even to very recent times. It brings to light new political configurations and suggests that sovereignty and the exercise of political power did not necessarily run straight towards the modern nation state. So I'm slapping myself saying that. I'm, uh, I, I've changed in terms of a lot of the stuff I've been teaching over the last 10 years. I've revised some of the things that I've thought as well. I think it's important to be honest when you do a book like this. So the modern nation state is certainly important, but this work and in writing this book, it's convinced me that not everything was running straight towards the nation state well into the 20th century. And like their Chinese, Russian, American, and French counterparts, Vietnamese colonialism generated a complex historical experience marked by violent confrontations. People don't like when you take their land. Violent confrontations with indigenous people, the Cham, many highland people, the Khmer, whom they conquered. But it was also marked by often peaceful exchanges with these, peach, with these people. And all of this has had important ramifications to this day. So today's nations as we know them, including Vietnam, are often historical products of pre-existing multi-ethnic empires. And Vietnam, I think, like the United States or like the Russian Federation, is not necessarily an exception. It's the product of several imperial pasts, including its own. And so throughout this book, and again, I've said it well into the 20th century, I try to show the extent to which colonial forms persisted in direct, but also in indirect uh, forms. So my book admittedly zooms in on the 19th and 20th centuries, but I made a point of including three chapters on the pre-1858 period. In other words, for my general history, the pre-1858 period is not historical background. It's not, let's get the historical background out of the way and let's get to 1848, 1842, let's get to 1858, uh, let's get to 1798 and get on with the story. It opens me up to criticism, but I still believe that this is gonna make, I, I hope, it's my bet, that it'll make for a more difficult read perhaps, but I think a more interesting one in the end. Uh, the, a new account of the plurality of Vietnam's 
of Vietnam from the past to present. And so the periodization, by avoiding 1858, I tried to avoid creating that great divide. I try to avoid creating a great divide at the French colonial moment of 1858 between East and West, between modern and on unmodern, between before and after, between unified and defied, divided, between Viet and non-Viet. Some will object that by exploring Vietnam's colonial, diverse, and divided past, I'm engaging in a postmodernist fetish for deconstructing or worse, that I'll end up legitimating maybe conservative justifications for foreign inter intervention in Vietnam, I politely disagree. If I take issue with anything in the politics of writing the Vietnamese past, it is just a persistent tendency inside, I think, and outside of Vietnam to exceptionalize it. While I have no problems taking American empire and nationalism to tax, I enjoy it. I do not believe that we have to exceptionalize the Vietnamese and their past in order to take down or defend American exceptionalism. This is a tendency that we see perhaps in American diplomatic history. Um, we can come back to this point if you want. Maybe I have a small itsy bitsy axe to grind uh, that it's time to, we don't need to exceptionalize the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese can take care of themselves. They're just fine. Uh, but it makes it for a much more interesting read if we can then compare the Vietnamese experience with other experiences around the globe, including the American experience. Why not? Let me stick with this. It's kind of a sub-theme. It's the problem with the Red River narrative. The Red River, as I mentioned, is considered to be the cradle of Vietnamese civilization, the Dai Viet State, which was, you know, even existed for a short time before the Chinese came. I start my general history off in the Red River like everyone else does. When you write a narrative, you gotta, you gotta start somehow. My choice was to start in the North, but my choice was to end with non-Vietnam. My choice was to weave in, to avoid a teleological spin in my book, in chapter 14, the last chapter, was Vietnam beyond the Red River. And what did I do? I went all the way back in time and then came all the way up to the end of the 20th century around the theme of non-Viet Vietnam. In other words, I write the highlands into the story, I write the Cham into the story, and I write the Khmer into the story with a lot of different, I didn't get everybody in there, but you get my point, is that these three spaces, Highland Vietnam, Cham Vietnam, Khmer Vietnam, uh, I was able to tell kind of a counter narrative. I reversed the narrative uh, so that it wasn't one just reading from north to south, a Vietnam centric and ethnocentric take on these very important uh, other parts of Vietnam who were conquered and colonized, but who have a story to tell as well, which existed uh, before the S, yes, that existed before the Vietnamese left the Red River Delta on this colonial expansion of which I spoke a moment ago. To be honest with you, it was, I got the idea from reading quite a bit on the new Western history in the United States, which took off in the 1980s and 1990s and which has grown over the, the last few decades. I'm thinking of a lot of the historians who contested rejected and rewrote a, a new history of the American West, the American past. And they turned on its head or they rejected the Turner thesis of the development of the American past. And to be honest, I had the idea that something similar needed to be done with the Nam Thien, the southward move, which is a very Turner in uh, take on Vietnam. This idea is that it's go west young man, go south young man, the hardy. It's true, it's true. I mean, you know, that, that, that existed. You saw the Colonial Project, but we now have to factor in the non-Viet people uh, into, into this story. If you talk about colonialism, you have to talk about conquest. And if you talk about conquest, you have to talk about resistance. 
People resisted the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese resisted the Chinese. The Vietnamese resisted as well the French. In my book, I talk a lot about resistance to colonial domination, uh, to colonial conquest. I mean, oftentimes this was a violent affair when people take land from other people. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people resisted. That's in there, but I also took a chance and I wove in the flip side of resistance, and that's collaboration. So again, I want to be real clear about this, is that resistance, it's, it's, there's two sides of the same coin, resistance and collaboration in my opinion. We can develop it a little bit more in the question and answer period. So I do talk about resistance in my book, and in, as a lot of others have already. But I also wanted to include colonial collaboration because there was so much violence, colonial violence, during the Chinese period, Chinese Vietnam, but also during the Cham and the Khmer and all those who were conquered as well by the Vietnamese, and then the Vietnamese who had to deal with the French. And then let's face it, war created very complex situations where people resisted the invaders, whether they be French, Americans, or others, but oftentimes they had to collaborate. Collaboration, I think it's important to have a definition, and I want to give you one. Collaboration is almost always occupier-driven. I'm borrowing Jan Gross's definition of collaboration for Eastern Europe during the Second World War. Collaboration is almost always occupier-driven, and it's established and administered through the conqueror's threat or use of superior military force, which impacts profoundly upon local choices, loyalties, and a range of social and political relationships. Collaboration can mean cooperating with the occupier in order to survive difficult, indeed life-threatening situations. The need to feed and care for one's family and loved ones is always an essential consideration in such troubled times. And the troubled times I'm, I'm talking about here, it's not just the arrival of the French. Keep that in mind. Uh, this is something that I'm trying to weave through, resistance and collaboration. Secondly, by forcing regime change, occupiers provide a chance for marginalized groups to advance their political and social agendas. Intentionally or not, new occupiers often revive long dormant debates and exacerbate pre-existing socio-political tensions in new ways. Think of Vichy France. Lastly, collaboration is never unchanging. It's never static. It changes as the occupier's strength weakens, the likelihood of outside intervention increases, or the international balance of forces shifts. And as it does, strategies of cooperation and strategies of resistance to occupiers change accordingly. This does not excuse purely self-interested collaborators. These people existed in Vietnam, they existed in Cham Vietnam, as they did in France and throughout world history. But not all peasants, not all mandarins, and not even all kings who stayed on to work under the French were simple traders or they were simple traders at the outset. They were, above all, vanquished. If we go to the French, as my, my, my case study, the French monopolized the use of modern violence and they didn't hesitate to employ it. Given the asymmetrical nature of the battlefield in the late 19th century Vietnam, the rapid collapse of the Vietnamese army left civilians with little choice but to collaborate with the occupier, retreat into the hills, or to risk serious bodily harm. So people resisted. The Vietnamese resisted. Elites uh, resisted. Mandarins resisted. We know this. 
But you have to keep in mind that the French army often responded to such resistance with extreme violence, burning villages and pagodas to the ground with no consideration of the impact on individual lives, possessions, and subsistence. And for the men, women, and children caught in the crossfire, choices, and this is another sub-theme, rarely appeared in black and white. Despite drawing upon, sorry, oral sources collected from the rural poor at the start of the 20th century. Father Leopold Cadier, who spoke Vietnamese fluently, he collected oral sources from the rural poor who had survived the French assault in the late 19th century. And here, as in other parts of my book, I try to capture how people had to deal with the violence of colonial conquest and war. Things were never as clear as they would seem. I think it's important that a book on Vietnam, I'm not saying that all of the history of Vietnam is violent. I had to pick some of my themes and, and justify them. I'm not saying Vietnam is a history of just violence, colonialism, and war. I'm just saying that resistance has been one of the themes which has been taken up in the histories of Vietnam that exist, and I keep it in there because conquest is violent. But I also tried to weave in the question of collaboration and that it's not just a simple question of selling out your country. It's a question where you could be someone on the ground and you need to take into consideration life and death questions uh, and you make choices and they're not in black and white. But collaboration also allowed formerly marginalized groups to assert themselves and their projects. The Vietnamese drove the Ming Chinese out of China in the 15th century. There's no doubt about it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but thousands of Vietnamese elites also welcomed the Chinese and saw in their presence the chance to push through a socio-political revolution of a Confucian kind. Even the victors of the Chinese would embrace Chinese statecraft, culture, military science, and colonial ideology in order to modernize their state and grow their own empire at the expense of the Cham and the Highlander peoples, as I mentioned a moment ago. There's examples of this at all different periods that I talk about. But this is perhaps also a way where we can understand in a new way why someone like Fan Chu Ching, there was two great heroes in early Vietnamese resistance history, Fan Boi Chau, who resisted the French. He went abroad to Japan. He wanted to create, you know, he wanted to drive out the French by, by violent means. Whereas Fan Chu Ching, it's more complicated, and I think historians have had a hard time explaining why. I would like to suggest that if we think of it this way, we might be able to explain someone like Fan Chu Ching a little bit better. Fan Chu Ching collaborated with the French. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, just wait. He turned to the French at the turn of the 20th century in order to push through the modern reforms so many of his kind, including Mandarins, had wanted, but the Nguyen Dynasty had never really successfully implemented. These desires for reform didn't just disappear because the French got there. His reforms included the well-known goals of introducing Western studies, a mass educational system, instruction in French and Quoc Ngu, development of industry, commerce, the economy. But Qing wanted more than just a colonial Meiji. He also became an ardent Republican and a partisan of individual rights and representative politics. Though he can never say it publicly, he also wanted to use the French to help him accomplish a Vietnamese revolution. And that revolution, I submit to you, was the overturning of the centuries-old monarchy. Phan Chu Ching hated the monarchy. He believed in republicanism. You need to put yourself in that time frame. Violent conquest of Vietnam by the French, no denying that. But Qing also saw the possibility of using the Third Republic to promote 
a very Vietnamese revolution. And that revolution was, he thought, and he was pushed the French to get rid of the monarchy. That can seem mad to you, but I submit that that's what he wanted. The emperor had to go, and if the French could help him on that score, then all the better. More than anything else, Qing's collaboration with the French turned on his desire to use the French uh, to overthrow the monarchy and to create what he thought would be a colonial republic. He reminds me a lot of Ferrat Abbas in Algeria. Ferrat Abbas, who wanted the French to go all the way, direct assimilation in a republican sense. And I do think that this is something that Fan Chu Ching wanted as well. Ferrat Abbas went so far as to say that he denied the reality of Algerian nationalism in favor of egalitarian republican assimilation. He believed this. You have to put yourself in his shoes at the time. And he's very similar, I submit, to Fan Chu Ching. There's a lot that's different. Uh, but Fan Chu Ching also wanted to push the French to get rid of indirect rule and to, to get rid of the protectorates. If you keep the protectorates, you keep the monarchy. So this explains why Fan Chu Ching wanted to get rid of the protectorates. He wanted assimilation. He wanted direct rule because that, he felt, would be the ticket to creating eventually a republic, a colonial republic. It can be a contradiction in terms, but we have to follow these things as they develop in time and in space. It could only work, of course, if the French made good on their own republicanism. And as I tried to show you in my talk earlier today, that was one big gamble. But here's what he said at the time. Like Ferhat Abbas, I cite, if the French, I don't say he said, if the French help push through this Republican Revolution, I cite the only thing the Vietnamese would fear would be seeing the French leave Annam to its own devices. This isn't a traitor talking. This isn't a traitor talking. This, in my opinion, is a way that one partner in an uneven, unequal relationship takes advantage of that definition of collaboration which I gave you in order to push through a local revolution on Vietnamese terms using the French. So yes, the French exploited the Vietnamese, but the Vietnamese also had their projects as well. Why not go up to 1950 when Supana Wong, the Prince Supana Wong in Laos, Kai Son Pumi Wang, another Laotian, or Sangok Ming in Cambodia, they join Ho Chi Minh to create a set of associated states of Indochina. I try to show in my book that these aren't just collaborate. I'm trying to go in the other way. You see what I'm saying? You can't just write these people off as traitors. They sold themselves out to the communists. I try to show that they had local reasons for joining the Vietnamese to promote very Lao, if you like, or very Highland, or very Cambodian projects. They bet right, if I can put it that way, because they would go on to rule post-war, post-colonial, and post-war uh, Laos. Cambodia is a whole other kettle of fish, and we're not going anything near that right now. So Fan Chu Ching's colonial collaboration with the French was riddled with contradictions and not a little naivete. But again, collaboration was an important part of what went into the making of modern Vietnam. And colonial collaboration often carried within it revolutionary Indo, uh, indigenous projects. There you have four themes or five themes which I tried to weave through my general history. I think I've given you an idea of why I let go of 1858 uh, in a desire. So you can see that my modern history uh, goes back to the beginning. And I leave it up to the reader to decide what's modern. What's not? What's Vietnam? What's not? It's your choice. Thanks.